Green light's good. Okay. Okay, I'll get started. Uh, I'm Jean-Pierre Lechat, uh, part of COIN. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, hardware security tokens. These little devices have, this is a YubiKey, I have Nitro keys. Best part of the session is I have five keys to give away that Nitro key donated. So, and there's a lot more than five here, <laughs> so it's gonna be a problem. So what I'd like to do, if you wanna have a key, uh, write down what open source projects that you're on in an email address, and I'll pick out five people and pick them out, okay? So at some point after the, the meeting. Um, so first question, how many people actually use these? Okay, well, great. <laughs> so I don't have to go over too many. Um, I'm, uh, as s I'm gonna be discussing in general uh, these security tokens. I'll, I have most experience with YubiKeys and NitroKeys, obviously. I, I wanted to bring NitroKey into the mix because it's an open source uh, software platform. Um, which has a lot of nice features. So uh, um, most of the other uh, security tokens are closed sourced. Um, uh, and you can participate, they're very responsive. You can participate in the project, add your new features as well. Uh, it's fairly uh, complete in terms of support. It has FIDO, OATH, OpenPGB, all the standard applications that you'd like to uh, see. Okay, so um, since most folks know what a security key, uh, the basic idea behind it, uh, there, there's actually two main purposes that they solve. They uh, store secrets securely. Uh, usually the crypto calculations are actually done on the device itself. The secrets are not accessible in any way unless you use uh, password managers, like the Nitro key actually has an onboard password manager, and you can extract the secret from in that uh, particular case. But for PGP, PIV, Oath, uh, FIDO, you just can't get to the secret. It's, it's stored securely. Um, and then uh, it provides a number. Uh, once you have the secret now, you can now use it for a number of different applications, for mode access, for signing and encryption, and then proof of identity for authentication purposes. That's the other main feature. Uh, so as I mentioned, the secrets are stored on the token. They generally cannot be accessed. Uh, that's the whole point compared to a general purpose computer or your mobile phone, um, it, uh, uh, it, you can't get anything else on them. They just store the secret. There's no storage on these uh, generally. Uh, all the crypto calculations, as I mentioned, are provided. Uh, you can optionally protect the device access by a, a key, a pin, or and by touch. And some are now introducing um, some biometrics, like the YubiKeys have fingerprint detection now as well. Um, uh, optionally, you can also do what's called attestation, where th the secret is actually generated on the key itself, not imported into the key. Um, and do folks, are folks familiar with that? And how many people use the attestation feature? No one yet? Okay. So we'll go over that a little bit. Um, as I said, uh, usually when you get a YubiKey, it actually has separate uh, applications. So if you go to the NitroKey uh, GitHub account, you'll see there's different uh, repository for each of the applications. This is important because you can set a separate policy for each of the application. So the oath application, you may say you require a pin, but don't require touch, but FIDO, you require both, as an example. So keep that in mind. Um, 
uh, the main ones that you'll see on these application or oath. Uh, typically, you're going there's two protocols that are part of the oath protocol, and and this is what nor what people normally call like Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator. Uh, all the vendors try to obfuscate the fact that they're just an oath authenticator, <laughs> but it's just oath. They all implement the same protocol. Uh, there's two basic approaches. The TOTP is by far the most common one. Uh, I've, I've actually have never used HOTP myself. Um, the, the other major one is FIDO. Uh, part, there's a number of different standards with this. Uh, UTF, CTAP is the other major one. Uh, now they constantly are changing the names and obfuscating what this means as well. So uh, the term of art that's used a lot now are pass keys or security keys. Um, the um, other one is OpenPGP. Almost all of them support OpenPGP, and you can support a number of uh, PGP itself supports a number of protocols, including uh, PGP itself, but also X509 certificates and SSH. And then uh, PIV. Um, this is a federal uh, standard that was developed many years ago. It's based on X509 certificates, and it's um, you have to use this if you're a federal government um, employee. Everyone has a, a card that uniquely identifies them, and to log into anything, you have to have that card. Um, okay, so what are the alternative? Why would why are people using these uh, at all? So the alternatives are obviously passwords. Everyone knows we shouldn't be using passwords. Um, if, you, if you're using online banking, they're kind of pathetic in how bad they are in terms of authentication. So they're still using SMS or voicemail or email. Those are all known to be compromised. Uh, so for example, NIST in the federal application, they just say you can't use those. Those are not valid. Uh, what they say, these are very easily attacked through phishing attacks. Uh, essentially, you should not use the, any of those protocols. Um, the, the most common one now, when you, when you talk about MFA, most people think about oath authenticators on your mobile phone. So you install something like Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator. It's actually just an oath authenticator. Uh, you, you share a secret with a website, and then you uh, get this. The problem with, uh, with authenticators on general purpose devices like phones and notebooks is that they're general purpose. You can install anything on them. Uh, so for probably everyone's heard of the Pegasus spyware. Uh, people are familiar with that. So the Israeli government, they put software, they can do anything they want to on your phone essentially. <laughs> Um, and if the Israelis can do it, just about anybody else can do it at this point. Um, uh, what's happening now more uh, in Google is the major um, advocate of this is they introduce a concept of pass keys. Pass keys is just FIDO underneath the hoods, but they're trying to make it general purpose and use it on your notebooks and phones. Um, uh, the, it, it's good that it's FIDO. FIDO is, is a good solid protocol, but then you're exposed to all the limitations and, and the vulnerabilities that a general purpose device has to. Um, uh, it makes it more convenient because you can just use it on, you don't need a separate device, you don't need something like this, and still get FIDO-based authentication. And then uh, biometrics is the other uh, big one that's happening now. The, the important thing to remember with biometrics, it's not really a secret. You know, your face, your fingerprint, anybody can get that information and they can share it. So um, uh, fingerprints, for example, even YubiKeys, Yubico, uh, say they have a fingerprint sensor version of these, but they don't recommend it as, a, as, as another factor. They say it's too easily compromised. Uh, the way NIST uh, puts it is that you can use it as another factor, but it cannot be the primary second factor. 
Okay, so those are some of the alternatives. The advantages of, uh, of these, it's dedicated hardware. Um, some, you cannot modify the firmware. Once you buy it, it's baked in and that's it. The nitro key is a little bit different. You can update the firmware um, uh, as they develop it. Um, I am not aware of, uh, of any of these being compromised yet unlike phones and laptops and things like that. So I, I don't know of any. I, I did, before I came here, I looked at the CVE list and there was no reported uh, attacks. Uh, the other really significant advantage is if you put a pass key on your device, it's tied to that device. Uh, this, on the other hand, you can plug it into a mobile phone, you can plug it into your work computer, you can plug it into your home computer, and all your secrets are here in one place. Um, uh, once the secret is on the device, you just can't get it again. It's, that's that. <laughs> it's as simple as that. There's no way to recover it if you need to. It's uh, phishing resistant. It, uh, NIST uh, uh, recommends either PIV or one of these hardware security tokens. Those are the only two that they recommend as phishing resistant. And, and honestly, it's easier to use than the alternatives. Uh, so instead of having to have a phone to get the token and then type in the token, uh, excuse me, the six-digit PIN into your uh, browser, you just touch this and you're in. Uh, it's, it's really simpler. And um, I have some experience working uh, with a number of companies that have adopted these non-technical people. They yell and scream when you first bring it, but after they've used it for a month, they, it's easier than anything they've used in the past. Um, okay, so now we get to the, the, what this session is really about. Um, okay, so you decided uh, security tokens are a great idea, I want to adopt them. What are the things that you need to think about to deploy them effectively? Um, first, you have to um, think about how you're going to deploy them in the full life cycle of uh, deployment, usage, decommissioning after the employees left, and then worrying about where was this used and across the internet, across your company's servers, as an example. Um, second thing, remember I keep saying the secret, once it's on this, you cannot get to the secret again. So what happens if you lose this device? Do you have a backup method? Um, so backup is absolutely essential, and you've got to plan for it ahead of time. You can't wait till after the fact. Um, then uh, one thing that's not often considered is where is this being used? So if I have FIDO-based authentication, who's logged on and which devices that they use across all my servers? And how do I clean up in case this is stolen? Who can get to uh, my servers if, if the device is stolen? And then um, another issue, uh, this is particularly important for like the PIV application where you use the device to prove identity, but it's generally for authentication. Do you need to preserve the identity, your identity across time? So uh, besides PIV, the other place this comes up is your GPG, um, or excuse me, your open PGP signature. Uh, does everyone use PGP here? Okay, a mix <laughs> there. So you, you realize that uh, your signature uh, lives for a very long time. It's a web of trust uh, model. So you, people you know and trust will sign, or uh, the other way around, people that you know who trust who you really are will sign your, uh, uh, your keys. Um, if you lose those keys, all, the, all that um, authentication goes away. It just disappears. So identity, preserving identity for PGP is, is really cr uh, very, very important. Um, okay, so uh, first thing to consider is what's the lifetime of some of these uh, secrets? 
So as an example, uh, FIDO, OATH, and SSH keys, once they're generated, they live forever. There is no mechanism, there's literally no technical mechanism to say they expire after two years. Uh, why is this important? If your key is stolen, can they, how long will they be able to get onto your servers? And the answer can be forever, uh, honestly. Um, the, so the, the first thing that you need to do is when you're uh, provisioning or decommissioning, you have to make sure you securely wipe the device completely. That's, that's the first step. So I'm going to worry just about the first step of when I'm provisioning and decommissioning, no one's stolen my, my key yet. We'll worry about the next case when someone has stolen the key. Um, all of these, uh, all, these uh, um, all the different keys have a way of securely wiping them. You have to follow this process. It's much too easy to uh, save a credential that from a previous employee. Um, and this is where the fact that you have multiple applications on a device it matters a lot. Uh, you have to reset every application uh, individually. Um, and then once you do the um, decommissioning, uh, some of the advanced features just get wiped out or set to a default. So for example, the PGP password defaults to 123456. Probably not a good choice to keep <laughs> afterwards. So here's some, uh, and I'm going to have a list of these. Here's some guidelines. You've got to erase and reset each of the applications. Um, you need to define a PIN and password policy for each application. Uh, this is really essential. I don't know how many of you are using this without a PIN on your FIDO device, but that means if anyone, if without a PIN, uh, they can access like Google Workspace uh, uh, simply. With a PIN, you have a little bit of protection. Uh, so I recommend setting a PIN policy for each of the application, and I and I recommend making it a strong password. Uh, second thing, to protect yourself against a rootkit on your uh, notebook or phone, I recommend defining a touch policy. So this prevents a, a, a virus or a rootkit from manipulating your device and logging into other servers. Uh, how many people enable the touch policy? Okay, so a few. Uh, all of them require this. So on the YubiKey, it's the two little uh, things here on the side. On the Nitro key, it's the body that you have to press. And the little light will flash, and there'll be a prompt saying, please touch the device to prove that you're here, kind of thing. OK, N next thing is, how, again, how long do these uh, secrets live? And I've organized it by the type of um, secret that you're using and then the particular thing. So with identity, you don't really get identity unless you're using PGP or PIV. Um, the secrets, um, you have the ability to remember I mentioned um, um, cr uh, the credentialing part. You can either generate the secret on board or import them. Uh, with oath, you. Oath, you have to do a key, a secret exchange. So, you know, when you register a site and you register a new MFA device, they give you a QR code to scan or, a, or an actual secret. Um, you have to import that in. There's no way to generate that. FIDO is the inverse. You cannot import a secret. You have to generate it on the device, and that's your only option. Uh, open PGP, you have either choice. You can generate on board or import it. Same with PIV. Um, provisioning uh, of OATH and FIDO and 
and all of them except for PIV can be uh, self-provisioned. In other words, anybody in your company or yourself can provision a new FIDO key at a website. You don't need to go to uh, someone at your company to provision it for you. PIV is completely different. There's a certificate authority. Someone in your company is going to generate uh, a, a PIV device for you, including the certificate that gets stored on it. Um, here's the, the last two rows are the most important. Is there any kind of automatic expiration? And on Oath and FIDO and passwords in general, the answer is no. They live forever. If they're stolen, they they're still out there living forever. Um, uh, OpenPGB and PIV were designed from day one to have uh, an escape hatch. They eventually uh, expire. Um, also, uh, there's no usage restrictions either on um, Oath, FIDO, and password, PGP and PIV. So, for example, uh, you can say this secret can only be used for signing while this other secret can only be used for authentication. Uh, PIV is even more uh, data, uh, um, specific. It can, you can go down to the level, this secret can only be used to log on to these three servers and no other servers at all. So th it's much more capable. Um, so, so um, let me back up. I meant um, by onboard generation, that this is attestation. It, if you need attestation, which means prove to me where the secret came from, and usually that means it, you have to prove it came from the hardware device itself, uh, you cannot use certain protocols, like OST just goes out the door, that, uh, because you have to do a key exchange. And you don't really know where the damn secret came from with OATH. It could be a hacker that's uh, hijacked a DNS entry for a website, and <laughs> you've got a completely bogus uh, secret stored on your token. Um, uh, uh, when, if you do hardware attestation, you cannot have backup of secrets, so you have to have an alternate backup method. So uh, I'll show you a, a, a very um, stark example of that. Um, and, and, ba and basically, um, wh what you end up having to do is either uh, purchase two of these uh, tokens or define an alternate method like one-time pass uh, words. So an example, uh, anyone use the Google Advanced Protection Program? Okay, it's actually a great program that Google offers, an extra level of security. Uh, however, to use it, you have to enroll with two hardware security keys. So you gotta purchase two of them. They won't let you uh, use uh, the Advanced Protection Program without this. Um, you can also generate one-time codes ahead of time and store them. The idea is you, you print them out, put them in a safe someplace, and erase all <laughs> knowledge of them on the internet any place. And if you lose both security keys, you go to those one-time passwords. Um, it, however, even with that, uh, hold on. Even with the uh, Google Advanced Protection Program, there is a bit of a, a theater here, and there's a lot of sec uh, security theater going on here uh, in this world. So everyone, you know, when you log on to Gmail, you have that little checkoff box, trust this device. Fam everyone familiar with that? Okay, what, what is that doing? Does ev everyone understand what that does? It, it completely bypasses the, the, the requirement to use this. It's like having no access control at all. And think of the attack scenario there. Someone steals your computer, you have a weak password or it's unlocked. They have access to your Google account. They're in, 
Even if the browser is shut off, you just start the browser up and, and it's on. It, it completely defeats the whole purpose of uh, hardware security keys. And after you set up the advanced protection program, this option is still en enabled, which is amazing to me. Um, and then uh, Google somehow still will use my damn phone to authenticate me, even though I took out all evidence. They, I don't think they have my phone number. I don't see it in any field, but they still have found my phone and will send me an authentication uh, message. So uh, I'm not terribly impressed with Google security, to be quite honest. Um, Okay, so here's what you need to think of, either personally or for your company. You need to define what's your policy for attestation. Do you need hardware-based generation of the secret? In general, I, I don't recommend that. I, I don't use it in my companies or recommend it for my clients. I instead do a, an alternative that we'll trust. Uh, I'll show you in just a minute. Um, Disable this trust device or use private browsing. Don't store these secrets or prevent uh, usage. Um, try to disable back, uh, insecure backup methods like SMS and email. Uh, this can be very, very challenging on a lot of sites. Like, uh, like Facebook is another example. Facebook, uh, to their credit, supports pass keys. They have for a very long time, but they'll fall back to SMS. Which, what's the point then? Um, uh, and then day one, before you even start using this, think out how, what's your backup method going to be. Um, if you need to preserve identity, you can't use protocols like FIDO. They, they just don't provide identity. There's nothing there. Uh, it really, the only options here are PGP and uh, PIV. Um, you then need to generate the secret off the token and then import it into the token. And then you have to think, well, how do I protect the secrets that are off-board? Um, and usually this g gets combined with a simple uh, certificate authority or, you know, uh, in large organizations, they'll use something called the hardware security module, a, a big, very expensive piece of equipment that stores all of these things securely. Uh, what we do instead is a USB stick. <laughs> um, uh, we ca I call this a credentials repository, and it's just a simple USB device that's encrypted. Uh, the key thing, it's offline. Uh, it, you use it on an air-gapped computer, and um, you store your secrets on this that then get imported onto the token. Um, so we use it for uh, GPG uh, secrets. Uh, we also use it uh, for the open SSH uh, keys and certificates that we generate. And then X509 uh, private keys and certificates. And I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. Uh, some more things we store. We, we set up a, a simple certificate authority for signing the, the different uh, secrets that we have. So we use it for PGP, OpenSSH, and X509 at this point. It also is a place where we keep an inventory of all our tokens. It's critical in, if you have a small company um, uh, and you're using these, you need to have an audit and that you, that you go through who has the keys, who's using which keys, uh, have any keys been stolen. That's the real thing that you're looking for. Um, and then keep in mind, and, and we use Git for all of this, so we have version control, we, we have distributed backup, um, and we don't need to be on the cloud, so it's very simple for us. And as I say, I'll show you an example of that. And then remember, there's really no practical way of backing up FIDO. You either have to get multiple keys or um, have an alternate backup mechanism. 
So here's an example of the inventory control. So we have a JSON schema that we define, and we just keep track of uh, this is a YubiKey serial number, and uh, we, we keep some purchasing information. The key things here, uh, we use the open PGP AID, that's the application ID. We use this for provisioning. We put, we, um, when we provision a new device, uh, we, we use these keys to log on to our Linux workstations. And we do that by getting the application ID and installing it on the notebook. Uh, the critical thing is who's it signed to. In this case, it's Wiley Coyote that has it. And the last time we inventoried it. That, that's the kind of information you need to track. Uh, so you need to create some kind of archive of your credentials. You can, uh, I, we're using this USB thing. There are very sophisticated HSM solutions you could use. And then maybe the most reliable thing is uh, just paper. Uh, and there's a terrific utility called Paper Key that'll create a nice, easy to scan uh, um, uh, paper copy of all your credentials. Uh, and, and we use that as well. Uh, you need an inventory of your security tokens, and you need a process for auditing this every so often. Uh, so I'm now going to step through each of the applications and highlight some of the, uh, some of the things that you need to consider. So PGP, um, uh, just a few of you are using it. This is a, a standard that's existed for a long time. Um, there's a love-hate relationship in the community around PGP. Um, I think things are getting a little bit better. There's a larger range of implementations now. Um, in fact, uh, the standard uh, tool that's been used for, uh, for many, many years is GNU PG. Um, but there, um, there's new uh, software systems. NitroKey has developed a whole Rust-based ecosystem to support PGP, uh, and it's quite nice. Um, and here, it goes through the step when you provision a PGP on one of these tokens, you have to define subkeys. Um, and you, there's three separate subkeys, each used for a specific purpose. Um, so when you're encrypting, you use the encryption subkey. Uh, there's a fourth uh, key, the certification. This is to certify that, yes, I trust this other person. That cannot be on the, on the hardware tokens. You have to do that uh, separately. And then uh, baked into the standard is a whole process for expiring, uh, uh, indicating that you have a lost key uh, that shouldn't be trusted anymore and a way of distributing this in, uh, through the community. Um, kind of the key things when you're using the open PGP card standard, you'll get this, you have to have the, the different sub keys, so that's kind of baked in. What's optional, though, is the concept of a revocation key. This is your backstop if, in case you lose the key. This is a way of telling everybody, don't trust this key anymore. It's the equivalent of the X509 uh, certificate revocation list, if people are familiar with that. So it's a way of, verify, of saying, yes, don't trust this certificate anymore. Don't trust this key anymore. Uh, set some um, uh, sensible expiration policies. Uh, I usually recommend two years for normal keys. Um, a certificate authority key is usually a little longer, five years. Um, NIST has some guidance on what to do here, so I'd recommend taking a look at their standards there. Um, and then you may want to set up a certificate authority uh, for this. So in a, in the companies I help uh, with this, uh, we actually have a separate key that's our certificate authority key that signs it. And then there's a concept of the non-revocable signing that's also transitive. So uh, it's, you still have the web of trust, but it's all rooted at the company CA key. Um, 
OpenSSH uh, is kind of a strange beast here. It doesn't have its own standard for using um, uh, uh, for hardware-based tokens. What it did instead is it adopted a number of different standards uh, that can then sit on top of them. Do people use the, these keys with OpenSSH? Okay, great. And, and this is ac actually one of the most important use cases here. You want to validate that someone has this key. They, they have an MFA based on a hardware token to access your servers. And you have a number of choices here. You can use a, um, uh, any one of these three standards. You can use PGP uh, itself. There's the PKCS11 standard, which uses the X509 certificates. So you can use your PIV credentials, essentially. And then they recently introduced FIDO support. So you can use uh, your FIDO key uh, to log on to an SSH server. Um, uh, that's been around for two, three years now, so not too long. The others have existed forever, uh, basically. Um, Keep in mind that SSH keys don't have any expiration or control of what you can do with that key. There's zero support for that. However, uh, SSH supports uh, certificates. Is that, do, does anybody use uh, certificates? Okay. SSH certificate instead of X509 uh, SSH. So few. You're you're the first ones I've seen. <laughs> actually, um, they're uh, they're a lightweight version of X509. The, that's uh, probably the best way. What's fantastic about it is that all the goodness the, the, those certificates. You can set an expiration date. You can say who is assigned to. Only this person can use it. You can say what servers it can connect to and what. Uh, commands can you execute on the server. There, and the best part, you don't have to distribute keys anymore. Uh, you issue the certificate to the person and you're done. No more sort of, uh, key management at all. It complete, completely disappears. So um, I myself prefer the PGP card authentication. I'm not a big fan of the FIDO because of all the problems that I cannot get a backup of it. There's no way of getting a backup of that. Um, uh, uh, the X509 certificate is also a perfectly good choice and I've used that for many years as well. Um, I definitely recommend using SSH certificates. If you haven't uh, looked into those, they are such a superior solution that uh, I, I, we don't use anything else except SSH certificate. Um, if, if folks are familiar with um, tools like uh, WireGuard, there's a whole ecosystem built on top of that to support the lack of certificates for, a five o, uh, for SSH. And they should have just, and it's very complicated, I think SSH certificates are a much better solution. Uh, you can also use um, certificates for your servers as well. Um, so you now can get rid of uh, warning, 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 I, I don't know this server, do you want to trust it? Okay, and what does everyone do? Yeah, sure, yes, of course. Uh, and my, you know, you might be uh, logging on to a, a Chinese server, you have no idea. With uh, certificates, that completely goes away. And I'll show, I'll show you an example of that. And then, do people know about SSHFP, the DNS? Or? Okay, another one. Okay, excellent. Uh, very few. So I, for the life of me, don't understand why GitHub doesn't publish their, um, their SSH keys with SSH, um, uh, with their DNS servers. It would, excuse me? Uh, probably not, yep. You really need DNSSEC. Yep, yep. You 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 are way ahead of GitHub. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's a separate issue than this. Um, okay. 
so I'm going to uh, try to finish up real quickly. So I did want to talk a little bit about compliance issues. I don't, uh, you know, if you work for a company or a, a government agency, uh, you need to come into compliance. Where I would start with is uh, NIST. They have uh, freely available uh, documents that are actually pretty well written. They're understandable. A human being can read them and understand them. Uh, the one that's relevant to, to this area is SP 864. Um, and as I said, it's freely available so you can download it. Uh, if you adopt uh, these keys, you are already substantially in compliance with this specification. It's, it's, that's pretty much the, the news there. Uh, it's um, in their terminology, they call these multi-factor crypto device authenticators. <laughs> um, uh, it kind of interestingly, attestation may be used, but they don't require it for most case, most case uh, points. And then they make the point that you cannot rely on biometrics solely. It's, uh, as an adjunct, it's perfectly okay. Uh, a couple of tips. Um, uh, just using them. They are pretty durable, but you may see uh, this one's chipped on the outside because I had it on my car key uh, chains, things, and I would not recommend them. Uh, YubiKeys in particular seem to be sensitive to humidity and heat, so if I put it in the car, it won't work for me. I don't know why. Uh, so I, I don't recommend leaving them in your car. Uh, the other thing is if you use these a lot, you may wear out the contacts, so a USB adapter might be helpful. Uh, where I'm using these devices, just to give you an idea of the range, and, and the kind of goal that I have, I haven't achieved this yet, is I want to have one password to unlock this key and this uh, MFA device, and that's it. I don't want to have passwords anyplace else. So in my company, that's, we more or less achieve this to a large extent on our Linux machines. Uh, we use it for decrypting. Uh, so when you boot up the device, we use this to decrypt the device. Yep. Uh, how do you handle this at home for your 20 servers? Uh, I, I don't. This is for uh, individual use. So, uh, so I should have pointed this out. It's not for servers necessarily. Now, if you do want to use it uh, for servers, there, there's a separate kind of device that's different than this. Uh, it, it kind of the equivalent, but, it, but it's different. So you can put, um, for example, your X509 certificates for your website can be stored on one of these as well. The equivalent of this, not exactly the same device. Does that make sense? I'll follow up with you later. I use it uh, to log on to the workstation. I use a, a PAM module called PolD. Uh, works great. Um, I, I unlock my wallet, my password wallet with this as well, again, using uh, GPG. Um, do people c assign their commits? You should. The Linux kernel requires that. Uh, as an example, and other projects should. I use that uh, for this. I, I sign and encrypt my email with Kmail. Uh, website access, obviously, FIDO, OATH, all, all the different kinds of things. Um, okay, and that's it. Um, so uh, I can answer questions or I can show you some of these things too. So. Sorry, you knew it was going to be me. Um, I have a question about a password manager that allows you to put in two of the, the keys to allow access and only require one of them. So you have a, a backup. You don't lose access to your, to your password manager just because you lost one of these devices. Oh yeah, you can do that. There are, there are some that will support that. So for example, um, people use uh, the GNU Pass uh, program. Um, it, it's, a ter okay. it's a terrific password manager, super lightweight, uh, very easy to use. It, it uses GPG on top, but you can use multiple keys to sign and, and encrypt. 
so so you can have a backup. It's uh, GPG is fantastic that way. It's it's easy to uh, assign backup keys. Yeah. Uh, so you said something uh, during uh, near the beginning of the talk uh, that I don't believe is actually true, which is that um, these uh, security tokens are phishing resistant, um, and the reason they're not um, is that. The, is basically the good, the, uh, good old Needham Schroeder problem uh, that the user of the token doesn't know what the, doesn't know what they're um, do, doesn't know what they're authenticating to when they push the button because all they get is a blinking light. Um, so I can be connecting to Alice.com and thinking that's who I'm at, who I'm authenticating to when Alice.com is really connect, is really forwarding uh, forwarding my request to Bob.com and I'm getting the request from him and then Alice is is impersonating me to Bob. Um, so I, in order to fix that, I'm going to need, either need a separate hardware token for each site, um, or I'm going to need a trusted hard, need a trusted screen on my token that can that can tell me what it is I'm actually saying when I push that button. Yeah. So uh, so I, I I kind of agree with you, but it, but I don't think it's quite as bad as you're saying. So like Fido, for example, you have had to have registered the Fido key initially. If you've registered it to a hijack site, a pirate site, you, there's no hope at that point, and I agree with you, you're broken. But once you've registered at the real site, there, even if you get redirected to another pirate site, it's useless. You just can't log in, and they can't capture anything that would help them log into the real site. Unlike, unlike, uh, say, for example, an email. Uh, yeah. So, I, so I don't think this is really a protocol problem at all. Uh, that, so, the FIDO protocol is fine. Um, I, I'm uh, all, all the all the information that ought to be captured in the signature is captured. The problem is that I'm not actually reading that information before I push the button. Um, so, I could I, I, I could be inadvertently saying I want to log into something when that's not what I wanted. Oh, I see. Yeah, you get tricked into going to this. It's going to accept you anyway. Okay. Yes. Yes, it can get you into the wrong site, and and you think you're say. So, for example, you're going. To, you think you're going to Google Workspace, but you're going to a Russian website instead. <laughs> uh, yeah, they can trick you into doing that. They don't have access to your Google Workspace. Is a is the thing. Uh, so the problem is the other way around, uh, that I'm going to a Russian website um, uh, when, when, when actually what I'm signing is saying I want to go to Google. Yeah, and, 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 and now the Russian website is impersonating me to Google. Yeah, that's right. I agree. Yeah. Well, we can follow up separately if there's more. Sure. Um, how do we convince banks and other <laughs> yeah. companies to actually adopt uh, so, uh, I'll tell you what I did. So um, I was struggling with my financial services uh, company, and I could not find one. I finally found one. Merrill Lynch uh, will support FIDO. It's not security theater. There's none of this garbage SMS or, or backup methods like that. And uh, I moved all my business over to Merrill Lynch. Uh, that's what I did. I think that's the only thing. I, unfortunately, this is such a complex process that I don't know if the most consumers... Uh, in the, I will say in the commercial banking sector, they're more uh, reasonable. Like, uh, for example, my, uh, the bank for my company, they gave us a little RSA, secure ID token thing. And that's, that's for real. That's real protection. Yes, that's right. You have to you have to check. The Merrill Lynch guys are terrific. They say if you lose this, we can't help you. That's that's what they tell you. So um, I actually found a bank here in the Charlotte area that does you know proper security keys, all of that good stuff. Oh F and M. What's the name? F and M Farmers and Merchants. They're a regional bank. Wow, okay, yeah, that's they're, fantastic. Yeah, they're actually a smaller bank and they actually have all the security stuff. Yeah. It's wow. great. So we use um, Okta Verify, but this is for commercial and for employees, but yep. not for the customers. Yep, and I think that's a pretty good solution too, yeah. 
Yeah, there they provide identity services too. So what we talked about is a little bit of a mix of two, but mostly focus on the MFA. Okta will provide identity as well. If I wanted to uh, give some advice to our web developers about like what common toolkits or whatever would be used to integrate with the hardware keys for authentication. Like, do you have any advice? There, there's a, quite a bit of tooling now. So uh, Ubico has a lot of open source libraries that allow you to access. Uh, they provide a lot more features and than just what I've said, but all these standard kind of features. And then the Nitro Key folks have a completely open source, uh, everything is open source.